so you could say the whole the thing about assigning negative charge to the um, electron is an accident of history, right? So when I describe my current this way, it could have really been a positive charge that's moving to right. In that case, do you get the same result when you describe the force? So V cross B points out of the board, but this time my charge will be positive. So with this, it will be you know, positive E. So yeah, when you are looking at force, it doesn't matter if the moving charge is negative or positive. So that's really the, you know, that's a sort of semi-justification of what I said earlier when we were doing circuits, that often we pretend that the current is a positive charge moving in the direction of current, because almost always that doesn't matter. Even when we are dealing with the magnetic force, it still doesn't matter. The direction of magnetic force is the same, whether we are describing positive charge moving with the current or negative charge moving the opposite from current. The one exception that you should know is something called the Hall effect. If we have time today, I think we'll have time today, we'll describe something called the Hall effect. That is a one exception where the actual sign of the actual charge carrier does matter. So we're gonna describe that towards the end of the class today. Um, but other than that particular if example, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative charge. Hall effect is the single experimental setup that will actually tell you, okay, it, what you really have is a positive or a negative charge. So uh, the single case, unless there's a question, is there a question? <laughs> um, so this is a single case where the sign of the charge carrier actually matters. And um, there's a reason we care about Hall effect. Um, anybody here know anything about semiconductors? Yes, no? Different types of semiconductors? Yeah, I'll, I'll do a brief introduction. So, um, actually, I guess I don't remember too much about semiconductors either. So, um, you know, if you're dealing with a piece of metal, um, I don't, where are my rods? Uh, if you're dealing with a you know, piece of metal like uh, this is stainless steel, then charge carrier he here is uh, electrons. Negative charge, like no one's doubting that. So if you had a piece of metal, then charge carrier, the free, um, free charges are the free electrons. So it's the free electrons that are moving around. So charge carriers are negative. Like, all right. Um, the more interesting situation happens when you are dealing with the semiconductors. So with the semiconductors, there are two different types, conductors. And um, I remember their names. I don't exactly remember which is which. There's an N type, and there's a P type. Once again, I don't remember which is which, because <laughs> that's not really my field. But, um, but let me give you a description of the model of conduction in these two different types. One of them, it's just like with the metal. As in, um, in one of them, the way you would describe conduction is that you have some electrons, free electrons hanging around, and they are the ones that are moving around, right? The difference between um, this case and metal would be, and this is the reason it's called a semiconductor and that conductor is that there's just so fewer of these electrons. So in metal, you might have an entire very high density of these electrons that are free to move around. In a semiconductor, there's very few of them. And in fact, this number of the charge carriers becomes one of the uh, limiting uh, parameter for uh, what is the effective resistance of the material. Here's the other picture of uh, the other type of the semiconductor. Once again, this is either N or P, I forget which. Um, the other type, so this is the one type of uh, semiconductor, and the other type looks like this. So you can imagine it as being mostly filled with electrons. Once again, I'm simplifying it way more than it actually is. Um, there's uh, something about energy levels, you know, 
band gaps. I'm just skipping over all of that. So uh, this other type of semiconductor, the way it works is, um, so it starts out with something, that, a description that's really similar to an insulator. As in all the energy levels are filled, there's no electron that can actually move around. But the way this becomes a semiconductor is that there's some material that takes away some of the electrons. So there's essentially um, inner space that's mostly filled with electrons. There's some spots that's uh, missing an electron. Because you know, it still doesn't change the fact that uh, protons don't move around, and the only charges that can possibly move around are electrons. And in this picture, the charges that move around are still electrons, but so you know, here it becomes easy to describe electrons that are actually moving around. Here, mathematically, it becomes easier to describe these holes. Holes in my uh, complete uh, electron C that these holes as moving around. So you know, when this hole moves from, let's say, from here to here, then the real picture is that the electrons around them are moving around. But well. Could we describe this hole, which is technically you know, positively charged compared to the rest of the material? Um, does it make sense if I describe this hole as moving? And you know, when you look at this, you might say, oh, this is just some mathematical convenience. Like if you describe the current in this semiconductor as flowing as this hole, that's just mathematical convenience. The real charge that's still moving is still electron. This is the context where Hall effect is important. Because this is a one experimental setup that will distinguish between is your charge carrier positive or negative. And um, th that's the experiment that's done with these two materials. And this gives one result that says your charge carrier is negative. This gives the other result that says your charge carrier is indeed positive. So in the case, that makes the case stronger that you can truly think of charge carrier here as being positively charged, rather than, I, I don't know, I sort of think of this like the uh, uh, geocentrism versus the heliocentrism debate. As in, you know, is heliocentrism simply a mathematically convenient way to calculate the positions of planets? Or is that the way things actually move? And with the Hall effect, it becomes easier to argue that the movement of the holes, that's the way things really move not just the mathematical convenience. Anyway, so let me describe the setup. I only have like four minutes to finish describing. And so let me call this Hall effect apparatus. Hall effect apparatus. And um, in this example, it's going to be easier for me to draw the picture if I orient the direction of magnetic field perpendicular to the plane. So I'll say my magnetic field, which I've been drawing in blue, my magnetic field is, let's say it's pointed into the board. Okay. And I'm just going to draw a few of these here. But you should really imagine the entire space as being filled with uniform magnetic field that's pointing into the board. OK. And what I, have, what I am able to set up in this space is I can you know, place a conductor, or semiconductor rather, for the case where it actually matters. And I, I can hook it up to a battery. I can hook up the left hand to a battery, let's say positive terminal of the battery, and the right hand to the negative terminal of the battery. All right, what direction does current flow? Supposed to be from left to right, right? From positive to the negative end. So this is the direction of current. That is not in dispute at all. Like, that's how you define current. And so far, what we've said is we don't really care if the char moving charges are uh, positive charges or negative charges. So let me draw the, um, the picture with positive, or picture with the positive charges on the left hand side. And, sorry, picture with the negative charges the more common picture on the left hand side, and picture with the positive charges on the right hand side, just to compare um, what happens in those two cases. So, okay, this is my dividing line. So on the left hand side, it would be um, if, uh, if a charge is negative. In the case, what it would mean is, all right, 
I have these actual electrons, or something that's like an electron, that must be moving to left. That's how I get the current that's flowing to the right. And the flip side of that picture is if my charge carrier is positive, then, well, I must have some positive charges here. Um, well, I guess I'll just say plus C. Uh, positive charges here that's going in the same direction as the current. Okay. Yes. And what you guys already saw in class was that in both of these cases, the direction of force was the same, right? You, for the positive charges, you do V cross B, force points up, force is directed upward. Same thing here, do V cross B, wait, uh, V cross B. V cross B is pointed downward, but my charge is negative, so the force points upward. So up to that point, it doesn't matter if the charges are negative or positive that would still say, all right, force is still upward. But the whole effect comes in when you consider, all right, so what happens to these charges due to those forces? So if I say, all right, I have these negative charges that are exper experiencing upward force, then this is what I get. I have negative charges that accumulate on the top side of this conductor which also means there must be a, because the whole thing is charge, net charge zero, there must be positive charges that accumulate down here. Right? And here, these positive charges are pushed upward also, which means there must be positive charges accumulating on the top surface here. And that also means there must be negative charges accumulating on the bottom. So when does this process stop? I mean, does charge accumulate on the top and bottom forever, or does at some point this stops? No, current will keep flowing. I'll continue to hook up this battery. I want this. Con so how, what determines that maximum? So I do believe there is an X maximum. No, I'm looking at essentially you know, some kind of surface charge density. And I do believe there's a maximum surface charge density. That at some point, you will reach an equilibrium where there'll still be the magnetic force that pushes these charges up, but something else will balance that out. What is there something else that might possibly balance that out? What do you get whenever you have charge separation like this? Electric field, right? Yeah, there's going to be electric field due to charge separation. That has nothing to do with the field due to voltage. It's uh, just a field due to this ch separation of charge. There will be this electric field established here that points up. There will be electric field established here that points down. What do you have once you have electric field? Electric field over a distance. Hmm? Not force, over a distance. Sorry, it's a bit of a vague question. I'm out of time. When you have electric field over a distance, you get voltage. Which means, so experimentally, you cannot measure this field directly. But what you can measure is you can hook up a voltmeter to the top and bottom surface here. And you can have a voltmeter hooked up to both ends and read the voltage difference between top and the bottom. Then, you know, if you read that the voltage on the top is greater than the voltage on the bottom, then your charge carrier must have been positive. If you read the voltage on the top is less than the voltage on the bottom, then your charge carrier must be negative. So this is a setup that distinguishes whether your actual charge carrier is negative or positive. And when they do this experiment with this type of semiconductor, they get that charge carrier actually is positive. So, um, so you don't, do, yeah, it's, uh, so, so this is treated as though the, you, your true charge carrier are these holes that have, you know, that are positively charged. 